Ghosted. We are currently in a series entitled Ghosted. And, and over the last several weeks, we've been talking about this, this thought process of, of man, has, has the church ghosted God? And, or, or even like, man, have we as, as an elder generation, are we ghosting the, the people and the, the children, the, the younger generation that's coming up behind us? Are, are we ghosting them? Are we leaving them on, on red? I'm going to explain that in just a moment. But, but to my understanding, a lot of times, personally, we can feel in this room, you don't have to raise your hand, but we can feel as if we have been ghosted by God. We can feel personally as if, man, I, God, I haven't heard from you in a while. And God could probably say that of us. Man, I, I hadn't heard from you in a while. Hello? Are you still there? But, and it, and it kind of made me think about while I was writing this message, I was like, you know what? Man, have I ever felt this way? Now, sure, there are some text messages that I've sent you know, that for some odd reason, the person has, you know, their, their little tags read, you know, as if like, if I send you a text and you open it and you don't respond and it says red, I don't know why you would do that because you made yourself look silly. Okay. Don't do that. Just take that off your phone. Cause otherwise, if I just send you a text and it says delivered, then I'm good. Like I've, I've sent the message. Like it's good. You got it. The ball's in your court. But if I send you the message, and you get it and you read it, then I'm like, I'm waiting for the pass back, right? You know, I know it's in your court, but I'm waiting for it to, anyway, I, I digress. I'll never forget, years ago, I was 12 years old, uh, speaking of fine arts, literally, I, I feel like two of these stories that I have for you today in, involve fine arts, so it's, it's funny that we use that as an illustration today, but I was 12 years old, we were participating in fine arts. We went to the national level at this time during this specific year. It was held in Washington, D.C. And uh, my parents, we were in between youth pastors before I had Pastor Johnny as my youth pastor. My parents took us on this national fine arts trip. God bless all the parents that do all the things in the room. You guys are amazing. And my parents took a group of teenagers to Washington, D.C. To, for us to do puppets and like all this cool like stuff, you know? And, and we had some singers and different people participating in different categories. And, and we were using, because transportation's, you know, kind of like a, a, similar to New York. It's not as crazy, but they have a subway station in Washington, D.C., the, the trams, the different things like that. And, and I remember getting on this particular subway. We were going downtown to the convention center uh, to participate and, and look at all these different things. And, and I'll never forget, I, I got on this subway station. I wasn't necessarily with the group per se. Like, I was in the vicinity, you know, I was in their area, but I w we were in the same little train, but I wasn't right up next to them. And, and a couple, you know, yards in front of me, we get to this stop, and I see my parents move as if they were getting off of the train. Well, unbeknownst to me, I, I don't even know if I pronounced that, unbeknownst, unbeknownst. Little did I know <laughs> that my parents did not get off the train. You know, they were just showing some Southern hospitality and getting out of the way for people to get off the train. And so as they moved, I saw them, so I moved, okay? And I'm off the train, and I'm looking for them, and I don't see them now that I'm off the train. Where, where have you gone? Parents, hello, mother, father. Like, I do not see them. And all of a sudden, I look back on the train, and there they are. My group of friends, you know, 10, 12 of us, and I was like, oh, wait, there they are. And so as I go to get back onto the train, I missed it. The doors closed. I know I'm 12 years old in Washington, D.C., and I feel like Macaulay Culkin all over again. <laughs> Home alone, I'm lost in New York, except it was Washington, D.C. Now, I had a choice as the train began to move away from me, and I began to chase it on this train stop. I start running, and people are staring. I don't care. And I had this choice in my mind to make. I could become like Tom Cruise in the moment, Mission Impossible style, and hop on the back of this train and end up on the news 
Or, because I could literally picture myself as Spider-Man, I was like, I'm hanging on, <laughs> not, going, not gonna get away from me, you know? They call my parents, hey, you lost your son? No, we don't know what you're talking about. We don't have a son. <sighs> I remember, I, I could have jumped, but I chose not to. And obviously, this story has a happy ending because I'm still here today. <laughs> don't live in Washington, D.C. I didn't, you know, make my home there. Little did I know, as soon as that happened, I, I literally, as dramatic as I am, <laughs> who said I'm dramatic? I fall to my knees and I just cry. <laughs> I am lost. <laughs> what do I do? I just sounded like the Grinch. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> All is lost. <laughs> I, I'm leaking. <laughs> so I, I am literally on my knees at this train stop and I feel abandoned. I feel like my parents, my group has ghosted me. Now, obviously they didn't do it on purpose. It was my fault. Hello, come on, we're gonna get there in a minute. But I felt literally like the loneliest I have ever been. It wasn't like a lost in the storm kind of moment looking for my parents. It was I am lost in an unfamiliar place. I've never been. I don't know where to go. I don't know anything about anyone or anywhere. I am lost. I'm lost. And, and all of a sudden, I felt, I feel like a guardian angel placed their hand on my shoulder, and it was a woman, and she said, excuse me, young man, were you supposed to be on that train? And I said, what gave it away? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I didn't say that. I said, yes, my parents were on that train. And, and she said, well, let's go to the information center. Do you know your, your parents' cell phone number? And luckily I did, and I called them, and, and they didn't answer and say, we don't have a son. They, they came back for me and got me, and all is well, and I came home, okay? Here I am to tell the story. Now, I know that's funny, but literally in that moment, I felt lost. I felt abandoned, and I felt like in that moment, there was no way to get a hold of my parents. I, I didn't know about, yeah, to go to the information center and go to a payphone. I didn't know any of that. But, but here's the thing. A lot of times, we can sit in that same place, in that same arena, and feel that same way about God. God, you are unreachable. I'm lost. I'm abandoned. Why did you leave me? I need, I need your help. And you're nowhere to be found. You're gone. My only source of answers in my life during that time as a 12-year-old kid are my parents. And they're gone. And maybe you sit here today and you feel as if you have sent text to heaven trying to figure out, God, are you there? And you're just looking at the three little dots as if he's typing and, and yet nothing's coming through. Maybe you sit here today and you feel as if your prayers are hitting a glass ceiling or, or, or as if your prayers have fallen on deaf ears. Listen, I don't know what your current circumstance looks like, but I know this, you're not alone. You're not alone. And I say that in two different ways. Like you're not alone in, in, in being like someone is in your corner. But then I could also say this, you're not alone because there are people in this room that feel the same way you do. And there are people throughout scripture that have felt the same way you have. And I wanna to talk to about them today to you. Check this out, there are three different guys I wanna to talk to you about, three characters in the Bible. And literally, like the, the Bible is full of different characters that we could point to, but, but I, wanted to, I wanted to hone in on three today. Three very familiar faces, three very familiar uh, storylines that you have probably, if you spent any time in church, you have probably heard before. But listen, all of these young men of the faith, if you will, have at one point felt ghosted. I, I want to talk about the first one in, in Moses. Moses brought the people out of Egypt or and, and, and the people of Israel are literally crossing the, this dry desert and they're wandering and they're in the wilderness. And, and Moses 
literally following a, a cloud in a pillar of fire and, and seeing quail come from heaven. Like literally, like he sees God everywhere and everything, but yet for whatever reason, he is in this place where he feels like he hasn't heard from God in a while. It's, it's been a hot minute. And he's sitting here and he's, it's recorded in Psalm chapter 90 of him praying this prayer. And he opens up in verse 13 and it says, O oh Lord, come back to us. How long will you delay? You'll, you'll see a common theme with these three characters is that at some point they have heard the voice of God or at some point they've seen God work, but for whatever reason, there's, there's been this gap. There's been this, this area of silence, this, this segment or season of silence, and they feel like they are out of touch or out of reach from God. How long, God, will you delay? Maybe you have said that same prayer before. And so he says in, in response, take pity on your servants. Don't you see me? David, in the same like manner in Psalm chapter 13, probably w literally trying to bide time to not be killed by King Saul, writes this in Psalm chapter 13, verse one. How long, O Lord, there's that phrase again. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? I haven't... Where are you? I haven't heard from you. Will you forget me forever? Then he says, how, how, long will you, how long will you hide your face from me? Feeling literally this desperation in a moment. Verse two says, how long must I take counsel in my own soul? Maybe you've, maybe you've reverted to your own merit or your own ability. Well, God, since, since you're not there, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just kind of regress back to my own understanding, to my own counsel, or to the, to the people around me. And listen, there's nothing against other people's counsel. In fact, that's biblical, but, but when's the last time we leaned into what God said last? How long must I take counsel in my own soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? No matter where I go, no matter what I do, all I see is him conquering, is him winning, and here I am running for my life. Elijah, the same way. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse four. Queen Jezebel threatens his life and he's running for his life, thinking that all is lost, acting like he didn't just see fire fall down from heaven. <laughs> and here he is wondering, thinking he's all alone. And in verse four, he cries out, I've had enough, God just let me die. All people of God, all pillars of the faith, all stories that we've probably heard about a time or two, young men of God, you see, church, you're not alone. You, you are not alone in feeling that, like this season that you may be going through or that you've gone through is just, well, there's no end. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. I'm just gonna struggle for the rest of my life. No, 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 friend. You, you see, we can empathize here because at some point or another, we probably felt like this. We probably felt like God wasn't listening or he's giving us the si silent treatment Listen, all of these characters ask the same question, but can I tell you and remind you today that God has never left anyone on red? <laughs> Number one, if you're taking notes, God always answers. God always answers. Let me strengthen your, face to, your faith today and your face. Come on, <laughs> we can go back to that message. <laughs> Let me strengthen your faith today. God always answers. Because Moses, though he wrote in Psalm chapter 90, where are you, oh God? Take pity on your servants. All of a sudden, the tone changes and shifts in chapter 91. He goes on to write this, and it's recorded. In verse one of chapter 91, those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. 
He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I will trust in him. Can I just pause right there? Because so many times we look and it, it looks bleak. We can look at our current circumstance and say, I don't know what to do. God, where are you? Take pity on me. But what was the point of him writing this in one chapter and then seeing something totally different in another chapter? Can I remind you today, church, that sometimes we gotta get, a, get out of our own little shell and our woe is me attitude and go back to the fact that God, the shelter of the Almighty, that's where our refuge is? So Moses continues to write, this I declare about the Lord. Come on, sometimes you gotta coach yourself out of it. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God and I trust in him for he will rescue me. And he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly diseases. Now we can stay there a little while and preach. But I want you to just remember that and table it and let's go on to the next one. Well, that's a cliffhanger, you're welcome. David, running for his life from King Saul, asked God, have you forgotten me? In the first four verses of Psalm chapter 13, it is this, God, where are you? It is this questioning, I haven't heard from you, I'm listening, I'm, I'm literally running for my life, can't you see me, hello? You better answer and wake up, because I'm about to die. How many times have we gotten to that place? God, I'm at the end of my rope. I, I don't know what to do. And then all of a sudden, there's a shift. All of a sudden, something changes. Something happens. And then David changes his tone. And in verse five, he says, but I trust in your unfailing love. I know it's been a while, I know I can't hear you, I know I, maybe, maybe I'm running too much, God. Maybe I haven't slowed down enough. Maybe I'm running for my life and I haven't just taken the time to just sit and just trust you and know that you got it. To know that you, got my, you have my future, you hold everything together, you got tomorrow going, so I don't have to worry what people say about me, say about my mama, guess what? I'm gonna trust and know who you are because your unfailing love has never failed me. We got to get to that place. And David says, I will rejoice. Because, watch this, because you rescued me. But was David rescued in that moment? No, he was just speaking on things he knew were to come. Sometimes you got to prophesy over yourself, baby. <laughs> so, like, I don't know, I don't know where to go, God, but I know you're going to lead me there. I know where my help comes from and it comes from the lord verse six i will sing to the lord because he is good to me remember that let's come back to it elijah our last character runs into the wilderness again having seen god move i'm talking fire down from heaven and then kills the prophets of baal thinking that he has stifled the enemy and all of a sudden somebody talks about his mama and he gets all upset Jezebel, this evil queen, and he thinks all is lost. I'm done. I'm gonna, you know what, God? If, if this is what your kingdom looks like, I don't want any part of it. Just take my life, it's never ending. Just let me die out here. And we see this familiar passage, even Pastor Chris alluded to it a few weeks ago, that God told Elijah, to go and hide in the cleft of the rock, and it wasn't the, the fire and the wind and the earthquake, it wasn't what we think the answer was gonna look like. In fact, it was a still, small voice that Elijah heard. And in that conversation that he has with God, finally, let me die, I'm, I'm lost, I'm confused, I don't, where are you, God? It's in that conversation that Elijah would be led to go find Elisha, a successor. Because you never know what you hearing from God can do for somebody else. But can I tell you in that one moment, did you know that Elijah realized because God says, hey, 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 
you're, you're on the backside of this desert thinking that you're all alone, thinking that all is lost, thinking that you're the only prophet out here that's doing anything. You're not by yourself. There's 7,000 other people that have not bowed the knee to Baal and you have a successor waiting in the wings. Don't give up now. You have a future that all of a sudden is gonna be because you say yes. So don't give up now. Don't throw in the towel just because I hadn't answered you the way that you want me to. Sometimes we gotta get in the quiet place. God, I'm lost. No, you're not. I'm right here. It's okay. Moses may have experienced a dry wilderness season, but quickly reminded himself of where his refuge lies. It's in the shadow of the Almighty. David, a shepherd boy who slayed a giant with a sling and a stone, running for his life, quickly had to remind himself of where his rescuer comes from, and it comes from the Lord. Elijah comes to grips with who God is when the Lord is willing to finally speak to him personally, and it's found in the cleft of the rock, telling him he's not alone. Church, you may sit here today and you can empathize with all of these men, You have felt abandoned. You felt like nobody's listening to you, that your voice is not being heard. Whatever it may be, whatever whatever caveat you wanna use, listen, I wanna remind you today for every single one of these circumstances that he is a refuge when you need it. He is a father to the fatherless. He He is a refuge in the shadow of the Almighty. Listen, we can run to him even though you may feel like he hasn't heard you. He has. He's listening. He's open. And his shepherd, our shepherd, wants to give you direction, a voice. Though it may be still and it may be silent, we have to be quiet enough to listen and posture ourselves to receive. God always answers. It may not be in your timing, It may not be in the timing that we desire, but God always answers. Watch this, Paul wrote about this. Paul wrote about this in 2 Corinthians chapter one. He's writing to the church of Corinth and and he's making his way, traveling around, he's evangelizing and and, and literally the church is expecting him to show up and, and they're asking questions like, hey, you know, when you're coming back, we wanna see you again. And, And he writes this in verse 17. You may be asking why I changed my plans. It's, it's okay. It's, and I love how Paul's just writing to the church. He's just being honest. He's, he seems like a chill dude you just want to hang out with. You know, well, I, I know what you're thinking, guys. It's okay. But watch this. He says, do you think I make plans carelessly? You think I just, you know, take reservations, right? I always come back to that. <laughs> Anybody can take a reservation. It's a Seinfeld reference. Anyway, do you think I am like people of the world who say yes when they really mean no? Like people talking out of the side of their mouth and, and don't really mean what they say. As surely as God is faithful, our word to you does not waver between yes and no. For Jesus Christ, the Son of God, does not waver between yes and no. And then I love what he says, he is the one whom Silas and Timothy and I are talking to you about. So he's bringing up Silas and Timothy, he's like, hey listen, we haven't left you on red. We're not gonna ghost you, we can promise. Listen, we're just, we're like God, like we're gonna come in this thing and we are faithful. Let our yes be yes, right? And so as I preach to you, and as God's ultimate yes. Wait, wait, Pastor Weston, does that mean God says yes to all the things? All the things, all the things. Like that million dollars that I've been waiting on, come on somebody, yes Lord. There is more, come on somebody, right? Listen, if God is calling you to give a million, that's M-I-L-L-I-O-N, just write that check out right now. Come on, I'm just kidding. But God's ultimate yes, like we can get all excited. Like God's gonna, you know what, Lord, I've been praying for that woman in my life. I used to pray that whenever I was a young, vigorous young man. I was praying for all the wrong things. Little did I know I had someone that was just gonna come and challenge me, someone I needed. I love you. <laughs> but I, it's one of those things, it's like we, we pray out of our own flesh. And we pray as if God's gonna give us a yes, like he's a genie in a bottle. 
or he's like a slot machine. We just put a little thing, come on, Jesus. That's what I'm talking about. Seven, Jesus, seven, let's go. <laughs> no, it doesn't work. It doesn't work like that. It's one of those things that we can get to this place where, where we think God's just gonna answer us in this, in this pretty perfect way. And we expect him to answer, and we expect his answer to look certain, certainly like, like something specific. Yeah. Kind of like when, when Jonah, Jonah was told to go to Nineveh, right? And, and he's, a, he's an evangelist. He's, he's on a mission, and he didn't like where God told him to go. He's like, I don't like that city, God. I'm gonna go over here. <laughs> Listen, good heart, bad intentions. <laughs> he, 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 didn't ha- he didn't have the right direction. I could imagine God had to tell him in that moment, hey, no, stupid. Sorry, I know you don't like, no, dummy. That's not better. Um, don't do that, <laughs> silly goose. Did you say that, silly goose? <laughs> no, don't do that. That's, that's go, you're going in the wrong direction. But listen, when God tells you something, I don't think God's schizophrenic. I don't think he's gonna change his mind. Oh, you know what? I told you the wrong thing. That's my bad. That's my bad. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna change it up. We're gonna change it. You know, you're right. You know, you're right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You think, you know, he's gonna ta-ta you? That it's, it's, shh. Ta-ta you. <laughs> Just a family moment here. <laughs> For those of you who are watching who are not from here, he's not gonna coddle you, right? So, sometimes he's just gonna tell you, hey, no! You're going the wrong way. I need, you to co- I need you to follow my voice. I need you to listen to what I said. I need you to do what I told you to do because I'm not always gonna just say, yeah, no, you're going, that's hot. Don't touch that. <laughs> She's not the one. Run! <laughs> you're right, God. You are so right. I'm sorry. <laughs> Wish I would have listened sooner. It's like you, you hold everything together and know my future. <laughs> it's one of those things we can get hung up and almost make what we think God said as a yes. But watch what, what verse 20 says. We realize, and Paul realized this, it ain't about us. Watch this. For all God's promises have been fulfilled in you? No. In Christ. Oh, it ain't about me. <laughs> Have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. And through, there's that word again, <laughs> Jesus. And it's through him that our amen, which means yes, it's let it be, absolutely put it in stone, amen, ascends to God for his glory. It's not for us, it's not for us. It's not about me, it's not about my building, it's not about our building. No, that, that building ain't for us. That building's for our community so they can hear the voice of God and be saved and walk in Jesus Christ and give him the glory. That's what it's about. It's not about me. So, so God always answers, number one, but, but number two, God's answer is always Jesus. His answer is always Jesus. So if you've been wandering and you've been, you've been praying, man, you've been seeking God, you've been trying to figure this whole thing out, the, the answer is, is Jesus. Now, I know like we can get hung up on semantics here and we can just say, well, like, uh, you know, Pastor Weston, that's kind of fundamental. That's a little elementary. That's a little too simple for me, you know? I don't really like it. Listen, so many times we often overcomplicate things. Is it really as easy as a Sunday school answer? Yes. Because you've been praying and fighting for your marriage when the answer has always been Jesus. You've been, you've been pleading the blood for that, that new job opportunity. God, I know you're calling for me to do a, you know, this career and, and, and I know, but like, I don't know, I don't know the answer and I don't know where to go. Jesus. Is it that simple? Wait, wait, what's Jesus got anything to do with this job opportunity? Because he wants to use you and the Jesus in you to minister to the job that you already have. What about that neighbor across the street? Jesus. 
Don't they deserve? Well, no, 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 Pastor Weston, he's called me to go to the highways and to the byways, and he's called me to go to Africa and Asia and Malaysia. He's called me to go to all these different places. But you can't go across the street? Jesus. It's not that simple. It is. Because if you can't go across the street, what makes you think you can go in a hut and minister to somebody? The Jesus inside of you. Jesus wants to know you, church. And he wants to make himself known. You've been praying for salvation, Jesus. You've been praying for your attitude, Jesus. You've been asking, you've been crying out, you've been pleading for God. God, I need you. And he's saying, I'm with you. My son is with you. I sent him a long time ago. His name is Jesus. That is the answer. Is it really that simple, Pastor Wesson? Yes, it it really is. So many times we want to wait on the, the bow to, to look pretty and perfect and we want it in a, in a silver package and we want it to look a certain specific way. But little did we realize it came bloody. It came hung on a cross. It didn't look pretty. But he died for you, your sin, your shame, your regret, to be the answer that you've been looking for. God, why aren't you answering me? I didn't change my mind. Are you listening for my voice? Are you looking for my son? So many times it it doesn't come in the package of a thing, it comes in a package of a person who wants a personal relationship with you. Last Saturday, Talking about fine arts, we, we held fine arts here and, and we were getting up as a family. We wanted to come and they wanted to see the cousins. Our, our daughters wanted to see the cousins and, and Emery was quoting scripture and Gabriel was gonna preach and, but they were like two hours apart. And so we got up early and, and if you don't know this about our family, Saturdays are kind of crazy, a um, little chaotic. About 6.45, we get a little person in our room, Kinley. Um, If you haven't been here before, I've told several stories about Kinley. Kinley always gives me the best illustrations. Um, So we're gonna continue another episode of the Chronicles of Kinley today. So last Saturday, we get up. They're playing. And in our playroom, we have two big, like, toy chest bins. And and this particular one is from May May and Unc C. Thanks. Um, And so there's like a lot of costumes. They like to dress up and different things like that, like Chewbacca, easy. Gabriel's gorilla mask, perfect, right? But y'all, I'm serious, like every five minutes it's a different outfit, it's a different costume. And so they like literally put on the pink Power Ranger, oh my gosh, that's cute, next. Ariel getting married, oh my gosh. And the, the sad thing is like we don't, I'm the only boy in the house, you know? And so it's like, Sisters, Mary and sisters, and we don't believe in that. So I was like, ah, oh, you may want to change. Yeah, okay, all right. So it's like, all right, no, that's no good. <laughs> change that. Um, you know, I don't even know what this is. Blue dress, um, Spider-Man. Oh, little thing. I don't even know. Like, but they, they're getting all this stuff out, and it's cool, and it's great and all, but like, <laughs> Iron Man, let's go. You can tell Gabriel has been in this, <laughs> all of this. <laughs> it, it's cool, but it makes a mess. So we got to go to fine arts. I mean, literally like Emery is, she's about to quote scripture. We got to go. I was like, leave the mess, load up. And Karis is like, load up, (laughs) you know, (laughs) sticks out her belly. So we load up and I am, y'all, I had to confess to Aaron, police officer Aaron, not Aaron, our buddy that plays the drums, but the officer side of Aaron. Hey bro, I, I broke her out three speed limit signs, uh, about three stop signs. It's just, yeah, it's all bad. Just to get here. Well, little to say, we see Emory perform and then, and then we get done and, and we're going to go home. But, and thank God for Rosa Hamas. (laughs) Karis and Cameron, they're like, hey, we want to stay. We want to stay at, you know, fine arts. And Karis is like, I want my Rosa. 
okay? And so they wanted to stay. Kinley wanted to come home. And so we're like, all right, let's split up. Y'all have fun. We're gonna go home. We're gonna finish getting ready for the day. We're gonna have a great Saturday. So we take Kinley home. And Kinley wants a snack. But I said, Kinley, have you seen the playroom? It's a mess. I need you to pick it up. And then when you're done, you can get a snack. Now, that wasn't really fair to her because it wasn't only her who made the mess. There were toys and there were things like that. So I just, I just told her, I said, I said, baby, listen, if you just pick up the, the, the clothes and, and then I'll have Camry and Karis pick up the toys. You pick this up and then I'll have them do this later. You can just tell she's like, you don't want to. And I said, I didn't ask what you wanted to do. I'm just kidding, I didn't do that. She said, I didn't want to. I was like, baby, just, just go, just go do it. And literally, she walked in the playroom, slumped shoulders. She just stood there. <laughs> Not wanting, just obviously didn't want to do it. And all of a sudden, I look, and I'm talking about the biggest stinking crocodile tear you've ever seen. Face is red. Look like this. <laughs> I said, baby, what is wrong? She said, I can't, daddy. She said, it's too much. It's too much. She looked at her mess and said, I cannot do this by myself. Like, where are my sisters? I, I didn't make this mess. I'm not the only one that was in here that did this. I can't do it on my own. Now, being the father figure that I am, I told her, I said, I don't care, do it. No, I didn't do that. And I didn't say, well, you better start working now. You got time, let's go. No, I, I was like, all right, I'll make you a deal. If you, if you clean this up, I'll help on this side. If you do this over here and you start putting those clothes in on, on that bin, I'll start picking them up over here and I'll put them in this toy chest over here. That sound like a plan? She goes, yeah. So she started picking them up. She got some stuff and she's all of a sudden, like her countenance changed when she knew her daddy was helping her. She started picking it up and putting them back in. And, and listen, we can look at all this stuff and say, it's too much. Pastor Weston, my, my mess is too ugly. Y'all, I bent down to pick up the first article of clothing and as soon as I picked it up, I just felt the Lord say, don't you love it when I do this with you? Helping me realize that so many times we get to this place where we look at our own mess, we feel like it's too much, we feel like we haven't heard from God in weeks or months or days, or maybe it's even years for you. But all of a sudden, when we know that God is for us, that he's not against us, that we are not forsaken, that, that he still hears us and he's still for us, we can be reminded today that he is in our corner and he's gonna help pick up the mess and what took us 30 seconds to do, it literally, all we had to do is just start picking up the pieces and start being obedient and start listening for his voice and start doing what he tells us to do. And then you realize, oh my gosh, the, the mess is, the mess is gone. Like I don't have to, I don't have to do this by myself. I'm not, I'm not alone in this. When you realize, you can say, you know what? It's gonna take too long, God. I don't like it. How long will you delay? And God says, no, 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 no. If me, if I get involved in this, it's only gonna take me a moment. It's only gonna take but a second. But you gotta trust in me. We can't get hung up on the mess. We can't get hung up on the silence. 
Because maybe it's not silence that God has given you. Maybe it's just time. Maybe it's just time for, for you to operate in the obedience that he wants you to operate in. Because guess what? I've never seen, I've never seen his children begging for bread. I've, ne I've never seen God not show up. May not look like what I thought it was gonna look like, but I've always seen him be faithful. I've always seen him help. There's never been a time where he hasn't. And I know that, man, scripture is very clear that there was something that those guys depended on that shifted their mindset. And I encourage you to do the same. Maybe you've grown callous. Maybe you're blaming God for something today because you feel like God has ghosted you. Friend, he hasn't ghosted you. He's for you. Listen, if, if us, who we're evil in nature, fallen, we're flesh, I make mistakes. If I know how to bless my kids and give them good gifts, come on, scripture says, man, how much does God love you and bless you and keep you? He's got a plan and a future for you. He hadn't forsaken you. He just wants to see you operate in obedience to say, you know what? My rescue hasn't come yet, but I know it's coming because I know who holds my future. Hey, if you just committed your life to Christ or maybe you recommitted your life to Jesus, listen, we wanna celebrate with you and connect with you. The best way that we do that is through a text. Would you text I believe to 84576? It is as simple as that. Again, that's I believe to 845 Seven, six. We have a team standing by that would love to connect with you. They want to celebrate with you. In fact, we even want to pray with you. All you have to do is go to our website, EuniceChurch.com, or you can download our church app, New Hope Eunice. Either way, we have a prayer request tab that you can fill out right there that goes directly to our team and our staff, and we would love to start this journey with you, connecting with you, and celebrating with you. While you're on that, check out all of our events that we have going on here at New Hope. Man, join a small group, sign up for Next Steps, and we can promise you this, that this will be your church home and you can find a place here. Before you go, simply open up your hands like I'm handing you a gift, and please let me pray a special blessing over you right now. God, I pray. Lord, for every person watching, that you would bless your people. God, that you would shine your face upon us and be gracious to us. Lord, lift up your countenance upon us and give us your peace. And help us, Holy Spirit, to anoint us and to accomplish the vision that you have given us here at New Hope. And that is to meet people and grow closer to you together. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you again for watching and stay tuned for anything and everything that we have going on here at New Hope. God bless.